이렇게 아, 아, 이렇게 뺏긴 거야? 나, 아이, 이렇게 더 들어오 넣었어? Ben oğlumu bu şekilde teslim etmedim. Dört tanesini öldürdük. Dördünü öldürdük. Fabrisi geri geldi. Küp fışaki Türkiye. Faşizan bir dikkat edin. He is the new red line. You cannot say anything against him. I mean, what are you going to do? If they want to arrest you, they'll arrest you, basically. Allerede samme natt som Küp fışaki utspilte seg, ble mange tusen mennesker arrestert. Ama geri dönerken ya yakalanacak mıyım, tutuklanacak mıyım? Çünkü herhangi hatalı bir şey yapmadım. Tamamen bir sivil soykırım nesnesi. They have a list, a long list, and it's a purge process. We all knew that this was a little bit fishy from the beginning. I tre år har vi jobbet intenst for å prøve å forstå hva som egentlig skjedde. Dolayısıyla Allah'ın lütfu derken kendisi için tarihsel bir fırsatın ortaya çıktığını gördü ve bunu gerçekleştirdi zaten. Muska Yay, Fırtayla, Ağan, Historia. First of all, we are really appreciated uh, by host, uh, hosting by you here and uh, we watch your video uh, about 15 July uh, events in Turkey and you focused on some details uh, about the events and some uh, they're really uh, impressive for us and we would like to ask some questions uh, about this uh, at first um, can you tell me about uh, yourself I'm a, I'm a journalist and a researcher So the combination of uh, being a journalist and researcher from the University of Oslo in, in Norheri, Norway, um, makes me, of course, curious about things. You know, we want to find out what is the truth about what's happening around you. And in this case, I was in Turkey because my wife is Turkish. So we were in Turkey on holiday on 15th of July, 2016. And when this uh, coup attempt happened, Uh, it, of course, uh, hit my journalist or research nerve, you can say, and I started uh, asking what, uh, what is this, you know, what's going on here? This is very strange. This is not a typical coup attempt, like I know it from many places in the world and also from Turkish history. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why I started thinking that I just have to investigate this closer. And your documentary, A Gift from God, concerning the events of July 15 in Turkey receive a lot of attention. How did you decide to make a documentary about local problem that seemed distant in a foreign country here in Norway? What was your motivation to do it? I mean, this is my second country. Uh, you know, Turkey, I've been there uh, for 20 years, uh, back and forth uh, with my family. I have family in Turkey. Uh, I love the country, I love people there, I love the culture. So for me, it was uh, experiencing this and having uh, my, um, my journalistic and uh, background, it was natural to start questioning uh, what was it. And, then, and it didn't only influence Turkey, it influenced uh, the whole of uh, Europe and, and, and more than that actually also. Since uh, suddenly people are fired that were working in, in Norway, I met people here in uh, in Norway that were fired because of the 
being in Norway, you know, and then the the coup happened in uh, in the coup attempt happened in in Turkey. So, so what's the relationship here? What what uh, what do they have with it to do? So it's uh, it's uh, also important for the rest of Europe, at least. And what approach did you take take to gather information about events related to uh, July 15? Who did you receive support from and how? This is a traditional way of making a when, you, when you're making a documentary film in Norway. It's a, it's a sort of a, a system for how you do that. First, you make a development phase and you apply for, for money for support for doing it from the Norwegian Film Institute and from the Regional Film Institute and from some uh, some uh, Norwegian uh, foundations that support culture and, and, uh, and journalism. So this is the normal way of doing it. So I did it just the same with this one. Uh, and I got some support from uh, some uh, local news, uh, new broadcaster here that wanted was interested in, in doing it. And uh, then we had the development, and then we started the production, uh, and we got more money from the same uh, same uh, sources. So all the all the finances are from either from ourselves, uh, because we all, most of the time also put some money in it, and or from Norwegian uh, uh, state-driven uh, uh, institutions that support film and art in Norway. So it's no Gulen money behind it. <laughs> it's no other money behind it. You know, <laughs> it's no CIA or anything. You know? <laughs> this is not normal Norwegian money yeah. that is supporting every documentary film that we are making. Mm -hmm. All of our documentaries are supported by the same institutions. And how did you decide where to film? Where did you start filming the documentary first? What was the significance of this place for the documentary? The thing is that I started almost immediately afterwards to try to find out what was this about. Because, uh, like it is being said in the film, there is something fishy here. <laughs> something fishy going on. So we really tried to investigate it and find out. But in the beginning, people didn't want to talk. And a lot of the people that perhaps could talk, they were in prison or they were very afraid of talking. So it's very hard to meet and find people that were able to say something. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that when I met the first people that started talking, they didn't really know too much either because it was a chaos. Like the, like the guy from, uh, from the um, Marine, from the, the sea officer, the Marine officer. You know, he says that... Uh, it was impossible for us to understand anything of what was going on. It was just a chaos. We, we got some messages from there and then some other messages from there. And we didn't really know what to do. So my only responsibility was taking care of the ship and my, my, and my people. You know, I didn't know what was going on. Because a lot of people said it's a, it's a possible uh, terrorist attack coming. A lot of people acted because of that. And then no, some then said it's a coup. But who is behind the coup? They didn't know at all. So it was very chaotic and a lot of the people didn't really know uh, what's going on here, you know. And of course, a lot of people didn't believe really in the Erdogan story, but they couldn't really say that um, what's wrong with it either, because you didn't really have the, the, the proofs of things. And that was, of course, the difficulty with people that was running out in the first time from Turkey, leaving through... Uh, Crossing over to uh, um, Yunanistan, I almost said now <laughs> to Greece. Yeah. You know, they uh, they um, they couldn't bring anything. You know, they couldn't bring papers or documentations, or so they didn't have any sort of documentation. So what what was happening? They could yeah. barely bring their passports and some some clothes. But then people started talking, and we could start finding out. And some other people started writing things in the in the in the papers. YouTube videos were coming out, and when I started investigating, the word was spread that I'm working with a documentary on it. And some people also started contacting me and saying I have some material, and uh, we we saw more and more <clears throat> of what was what was really happening. 
And the title of the documentary is associated with the sentence spoken by Recep Tayyip Erdogan about the event of uh, July 15. Why did you choose this title? Could you tell me a little bit about this? Uh, you know, um, it was quite shocking when we were sitting there seeing Erdogan coming back uh, to Istanbul and giving the first interview at the airport. Uh, and, and then a lot of people have died. People have died, you can say, on both sides. Uh, and we didn't know how many, but numbers were perhaps several hundred people had already died. And then uh, the leader of the country is coming back and saying, this is a gift from God. Yeah. You know, you cannot say that. You cannot say things like that when, when people are dying around you and a, a catastrophe is happening around you. So it was uh, it was devastating actually to hear it, and uh, and uh, and of course then we had to say how can he say it? How is it possible for him to say that this is a gift from God? <clears throat> and of course we understood that this is a part of the the, the setup here, that uh, it is a way of getting rid of his opponents, and not only the good and people, you know, all his opponents. The people that was too close to uh, the Western allies, NATO officers, because he fired a lot of NATO officers that I know very well. I met so many of them that are, they have nothing to do with the good end moment, you know. So, and he got rid of other journalists and everybody that was sort of a threat for him and his uh, power position. So in that sense, it is possible for a person to say if you are interested in keeping the power for whatever it will cost you, then, of course, you can say it's a gift from God. It's not very religious, but it's uh, it's terrible. Actually. And how long did the preparation take? Have you experienced any challenges in the process of producing your documentary? We were not communicating to anybody that we were making. I mean, other than the people that we trusted during the process and, and, and interviewed or met and talked to. We didn't uh, broadcast it in a way. We didn't uh, put out any messages for the Norwegian Film Institute where we got the money from, most of the money. Uh, we had a fake sort of explanation of what we were doing. We had said that we are doing a film about Europe, basically, you know, about the situation of Europe. And so uh, we were very careful with not spreading the word that we were doing a critical documentary about the coup attempt in Turkey, because that could, uh, for us, the most important thing was to produce the film, and then we could do then whatever could happen afterwards. But uh, so in that period, we were very careful. We were uh, we were traveling back and forth to Turkey, uh, meeting people, interviewing people, but very careful all the time because we knew that people stopped in the streets. If you had a camera in the streets. Uh, civil police could come and stop you and ask what are you doing here why you're doing this we, we have heard that from others so it was a lot of secret police and, uh, and uh, things around so we were very careful to do it and, and behave like we were tourists and since I've been a tourist in Turkey for 20 years it was not difficult also to be a tourist and enjoy also the good part of what Turkey has to give you know? so but it was another story after the film and during the production of your documentary, is there something special or a person who had most impact on you in the interviews you conducted for the documentary? What was the thing that affected you most? Of course, the most, uh, the, the toughest part of it was meeting uh, the family, Tekin family, uh, the mother and the father of Murat Tekin that was killed on the bridge, uh, of the Bosporus bridge. Um, and uh, then we started seeing uh, the real clips, the real small films that was taken by people there, seeing what happened, seeing the lynching of the soldiers and understanding that, the, uh, that they were just very young kids. You know, they were, they were not even soldiers, they were cadets. I thought they were soldiers in the beginning, but then I understand they're not even, they're, they're cadets, you know, they're students. Uh, and, um, and meeting them was very, very tough. And I think it changed us very much in the understanding of how uh, how wrong the whole thing was, so how, how crazy the, it was, so how how is it possible for a country 
to uh, to give away the youth like that. You know, they were sent out there totally innocent, uh, thinking that they were sent there to protect the country from terrorist attacks. And then suddenly they are in the middle of a, the most crazy crowd that was sent out to lynch them. So this was, uh, I think this changed uh, our understanding of what we were doing, the seriousness of what was happening, and, and, uh, and the human suffering in it all. And, um, and that is also where I got more, much more uh, important documentation about what was going on. Um, it is evident that uh, you offered a microphone to everyone in a neutral manner. Did you request an interview with uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan or his close circle? If you did and received a rejection, what did you think about it? Yeah, for me, it, I mean, when you're working as a journalist, uh, you want to cover the whole, his, the whole story. You know, you have to have all the perspectives in. I mean, it's uh, you know that if you only have one one perspective, it's not good journalism. So for me, it was of course important to to get all perspectives into this story, and that's why I contacted the uh, the, the Turkish embassy in Norway several times, and uh, we're in contact with them, and they were contacted Ankara and uh, and asking for an interview. So we were several times in contact with Ankara and the embassy to find out. Could we interview Erdogan? I didn't really believe that Erdogan himself would be uh, interested in being in talking, you know. But perhaps he could send some somebody else from the ministry, or because I've seen some from some other people from the ministry, they have speaking speaking about it, you know, or spoken speaking about it. So uh, I thought we would be able to get something from there, but uh, in the end, the ambassador said that no, they don't want to to take part. They don't want to speak. So then, what can I do? You know. Yeah, I think the I think it would make the film even better if we were able to meet Erdogan or one of Erdogan's guy to to ask these cr critical questions, you know, straight out. And it would be no problem for me to ask Erdogan about uh, some of the most critical points in that night, what was happening and why it was happening and how it could happen, you know. Uh, but uh, in a way, I can understand that Erdogan said no. When we consider that even those who implied that the government have had uh, prior knowledge of coup attempt were declared as terrorists and investigation was launched against them. On the other hand, Do Perinçek told in the documentary that he had informed the government about the coup attempt in advance. No judge in Turkey has ever called him to the court for these explanations about 15 July. How would you comment on that? Uh, I think Do Perinçek uh, has the position that he can say whatever he wants to <laughs> without being in danger. Uh, he has a special, very special part um, in, uh, in, in modern Turkish history. I mean, he's a leader of Vatan Party, a very, very small party, insignificant party in one sense, but a lot of the members in the party have a lot of influence in the state. Uh, that's why, and of course, Perinçek uh, is the bridge, is the connection to Russia and China, which is important for, uh, for Erdogan and, uh, and uh, the Turkey in the last 20 years. So, uh, so he has a very, very uh, unique position. That was why it was important to talk to him, but also because we got to know that he was the man that made the lists, which was important for the first arrests that was being done. Uh, and he made a list because he was in prison in, during the Argenikon case, where uh, Gulen people were involved in arresting uh, Perinçek and others. So he, he really hated Gulen people and, and started making the lists of, of Gulen the people around in Turkey. So the list was ready a long time before the 15th of July. So that's why they could actually start the first arrest started before the, the coup was over. They, they start, just started in the middle of the night. So of course he had an important position in what was going on. And he's proud of it. We know that your suppose is Turkish. 
Uh, do you still visit Turkey? Do you have security concerns due to the documentary you made during the visits? Yes, you can say we are not visiting Turkey. <laughs> and it's a clear reason for that, because we were approached by the uh, Turkish embassy afterwards and they told us that uh, because of this film, uh, me and my wife are now being seen as enemy of the state of Turkey, which I'm very sad to hear that. And uh, this is, but this is the way uh, the Turkish state the last 10 years have been treating journalism. You know, they're imprisoning journalists. I've been uh, to Silivri several times to visit my colleagues imprisoned there. Uh, I've been to court cases in Turkey many times uh, to support my colleagues. Uh, Turkey has been the country in the world with most journalists in prison the last 10 years. So, uh, and it was increasing right before the last couple of years before 2016 and the years after, of course. So, uh, so this is the way they treat uh, freedom of speech. And uh, this is the way they treat us too. Uh, we have made what I, I mean is a very, very objective um, film, documentary. And nothing there, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure, nothing there is speculative or not truthful. I have a lot of not more material, which I cannot guarantee the, the truthfulness of it, you know? And I cannot really tell the full story of it. For example, what happened with the bombing of the parliament in Ankara? It's very sp spooky things there, and I, I researched it for a long time, but I couldn't get to the bottom of it. So I couldn't tell it, you know? The same thing with the uh, Marmaris case, mm -hmm. which I research a lot. I have a lot of interesting film clips and material, but I cannot totally tell the story. Then I didn't want to bring it into the film. So, but uh, this is the sad, sad part of, uh, of the, the Turkish state policy these days. So uh, I haven't been back to Turkey since the launching of the film, neither have my wife. We miss it a lot. But uh, don't feel sorry for us. There are thousands of others that we should feel much more sorry for. And how do you expect in Turkey in the coming years? What positive or negative developments can we expect in the future? What do you experience? Uh, what do your experiences and readings tell you? In your opinion. How can Turkey get out of the cycle of oppressive governance? governance? Yeah, uh, Turkey has a, a difficult history. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, military coups before. There's been a lot of oppression. Uh, innocent people have been uh, imprisoned for, long, for many decades. The oppression of minorities have been there for a long time. So T Turkey has really something, they have a job to do, you know. And I think the first job is for the election on 14 of May to be sure that Erdogan is not re-elected. I think that's the first step for a possibility of re-establishing a democracy in Turkey. Uh, because uh, he, is, uh, he doesn't want to take, he has said it himself also, he doesn't want to take Turkey into a democratic country. He wants to take it out of the democratic countries and make it into uh, his, his, his place, you know, his sultan uh, way of ruling the, the country. So I think uh, the, that everybody now is going into an alliance to, to vote for someone else. I, I, I think it's almost the same, which is the other one, you know, because that will be the beginning of a new time. That will be the beginning of a new area where they can rebuild the relationship with their neighbor countries, with the Western countries, uh, with the democracies in the world, and, uh, and then, of course, release all the innocent people that are in prison and welcome back people that are sent out for doing nothing. Regarding the coup attempt, more than 40,000 officers and 50% of generals were either sentenced to life imprisonment or dismissed from the army. In addition, these people were labeled as terrorists. We have worked for Turkish army for many years, and it is a worldwide fact in the army that any commander who commands even the smallest unit 
take the responsibility of any kind of affairs in his unit. If there were some many terrorists, so many terrorists in the army, uh, would Hulusi Akar, the chief of the army at that time, not be responsible for his stuff in the army? Why did he went on being chief of the army? He is minister of defense now. Does that make sense, do you think? How would you comment on that? Yeah. It's a very intelligent question. It is. First of all, I think um, all of these officers and military personnel that was uh, losing their job uh, or being imprisoned uh, are innocent people. Uh, from my research, I cannot say that uh, any of them really participated in any time of any any type of coup attempt. And what is interesting also with the military, of course, if that an higher officer tells you to go there because something is happening, you have to go there. You cannot say no. I don't think that's smart thing way smart thing to do. You know, you cannot say that this is this is the military system. Then you are then you then you are uh, rejecting your your command and, and and then you can be imprisoned. You know. So the thing is that people did like some some of the officers I met, you know, they, they tried to do what they were asked to do, but they were sure that would never ever fire against the people. You know, and and uh, and, and they didn't. You know, they, they they didn't do that. So uh and and, and then we come back to to Hulusi Akkar, which has a very, very uh, special position. And of course, uh, Hulus Yakar and Hakan Fidan is the two people that knows everything about what happened the days before and during 15 of July, because it was a lot of negotiation back and forth. <clears throat> so these are the two people I would mostly like to interview or talk to, you know, uh, if they were able to or, or wanting to tell their story, uh, because they know everything about. And, uh, and Hulus Yakar is not innocent in this, uh, in this event. That happened on, on the 15th of July, and uh, of course that is that is tough for uh, for people in the military that are trained to to trust and believe in the system you're working in, that your top chief is actually lying to you and uh, cheating you and you're putting you in a situation where which is ending up with you're exposed or or imprisoned. So. Um, and of course, they are all a bunch of criminals, and they are supporting each other. That's why he became the Minister of Defense. Uh, International courts, human rights, human rights organizations, civil society organization, and other organization under the United Nations have remained largely indifferent to these events. Do you think Erdogan also has an influence on these institutions? I, I, of course, yeah, Turkey is an important part of NATO. Uh, Turkey has the next largest standing uh, military army after US in NATO. So Turkey, not only that, but Turkey has a position, a strategic position, which is extremely important towards East. So, uh, so NATO is in a way dependent on uh, on Turkey, and you have two other uh, things also which is going on. Turkey has uh, a, a small group of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, U.S. owned in a way, but it's stationed in Turkey. So losing Turkey from NATO would also mean that we have a new dangerous nuclear power in in, uh, in the world. Turkey has also started a new uh, alliance. Uh, not a total military alliance, but a new alliance with both Iran and Russia. And now they're negotiating to have Syria into the same alliance. This is a dangerous alliance, of course, for the NATO perspective. So uh, because of this, that the power play that Erdogan is, uh, is uh, doing, uh, NATO is very afraid of provoking him. So he is actually able to say whatever he wants to say to Western people and Western countries without them reacting. Uh, like you can tell Merkel that uh, you are a Nazi without her reacting very much to that. You know, you can yell to the Netherlands uh, 
uh, Netherlands people or, or country and say you are a Nazi country, you know, without any reactions. So he is saying all this uh, this bullshit, but has no reactions from Europe. And it's the same with with the coup attempt. Almost no reactions uh, <clears throat> from the European countries. This is very sad. But he has no he has no power over the human rights court. But the human rights court can only do a certain amount of things. You know, they can tell countries that you are breaking the law here. You have to change it. But so what? If the country gives a shit and they don't want to change it, what should the European Human Court do? The European Human Court has, I think, now more than 50,000 cases from Turkey. Uh, and, uh, and they're only looking into some of them because they cannot look into all of them. But I think they know very well what's going on and are aware of the break of rules and break of law that is going on and has condemned Turkey to uh, free a lot of people, like now the latest Usman Kavala case, you know, which uh, the human court case has said, uh, the European Human Court has told them to release him, you know, but they don't. So uh, they don't have more power than that. But uh, I don't think Erdogan has any influence of, of the court. Many of our former colleagues in the security sector uh, have become refugees in Western countries. Considering their past experiences, what can you advise for our colleagues to be able to do useful and good work? That's a that's a good question because I'm so happy in a way that uh, countries like Norway open up uh, our borders quite early <clears throat> and gave uh, asylum to thousands of people from Turkey. I know ma I met many of them, and uh, what I see is that this is uh, this is a gift to Norway, and it's a it's a loss for Turkey, because all the people that are coming to all the European countries now from Turkey, they are smart people, intelligent people, educated people, uh, people that want to take part, and that's what I've seen. You know, this is people that want to take part in the country they're coming to, like here in Norway. So it's only one thing. That is important. Learn the language, then go for it, you know. And uh, it's not uh, difficult to be integrated or find a job uh, here. But anyway, if I if I was to move to Turkey, I, I speak very little Turkish. I know a little bit of Turkish language because I haven't been living there, you know. Mm -hmm. But if I moved there, I had to learn the language immediately to be able to move around and, and stay there. So learn the language and and uh, and be as happy as it is possible to be in this case, you know because it's a tough, tough situation. Lastly, can you share your views on human rights violation in Turkey after 15 July and on human rights violation during the Russia-Ukraine war? Yeah, uh, it's two different situations, of course, because the first is, um, is a, a way of getting rid of the opposition in your own country. Uh, with illegal methods, uh, with undemocratic methods in Turkey. So the human uh, rights situation in Turkey is bad. Uh, of course it is bad. With, uh, with uh, thousands and thousands of innocent people in prison, babies in prison. You know, think about that. And, um, and Erdogan rules more than 95% of the media. He's, uh, he's deciding what uh, he has closed down a lot of media. He's closing down social media. You know, he's, uh, he's ruling in a non-democratic way. Uh, so the and, and the and the suffering of people is also larger because of his economical policy and the way he's grabbing money for himself all the time, making the country poorer than it should be because it's a rich country. It's a, it has immense resources. <clears throat> so the situation is is not good. Uh, if it's anything we can compare to uh, the invasion of Ukraine, I'm not sure that, of course, the Ukraine situation is worse because uh, Russia is bombing their country back to the Middle Ages, you know, with terror bombing. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, even a, what should you say, civilized war going on, you know, it's just uh, terrorizing the, the, the people there. And uh, Putin will lo lose the war, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to a, a world or a situation where Putin is losing the world, the, the war, Erdogan is losing the election, then I think a lot of things will change. 
that would be a good uh, because you know the election in Turkey is not only important for Turkey. It's if Erdogan is losing, this is important for what's going on in Syria. This is very very important of what is going on in Iraq. You know because he's terrorizing north of Iraq too. And this is also very, very important for what is going in Iran and the, and the democracy movement in Iran. I mean, it's it's not more than five to ten percent that is supporting the regime of Iran. But uh, we know that Turkey is ne- is uh, having economical deals with Iran all the time. You know, supporting the Iranian regime all the time with uh, with uh, with trade. So if Erdogan falls. It will have implications of Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and we can possibly see a, a development of, of democratic uh, movements there. And the same with, uh, I think, Putin. It will also weaken Putin because Erdogan is one of Putin's strongest and most important allies uh, in the world now. So that would be uh, that would be uh, yeah something to look forward to. Cool. <laughs> uh, thanks for the conversation with you. Wonderful to talk to you. Okay, how did it go? Yes, yes, Andre. How did it?